We're in the book of 1 Peter. Peter's words, not mine. Let me throw that out there. But we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 13. So if you have your Bible, turn with me there. And then please, if you are able to stand, please stand. And we're going to start with Scripture. And then I'm just going to go. Verse 13 says, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evil and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but bondservants of God, honor all people, love the brethren, fear God, honor the king. Lord, we receive these words. We ask that our spirit receive these words. We ask that we understand Peter's intention by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to believers the truth that is before us. We trust you in this, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, what's the two things that you never talk about, right? Religion and politics. One of the things that I never really talk about inside of church is politics. Because I talk about religion every time I get up here. Politics is one of these things because there's There's multiple sides, there's multiple truths, there's multiple views, there's multiple biases, there's experiences, there's there's just, it's messy. It's in this little messy spot that that as good Christians, we just stay out of if we want to stay clean. We just, you know, we kind of skirt around it, we do these different things. And yet, uh, uh, Peter is going to take us into this spot. Now, if we remember the last time we moved, that's still really hot. I don't know if I'm talking really loud or what. Um, Peter moved us to a place of practical use of the truth that he told us. We went through the theology of being chosen, of being sanctified, of being holy, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, us in our church more than most. And he said... If that is your truth, if that is your faith, then when they look at you and they bring lies and reviling accusations, they should be able to say, whoa, not true. And in the day of visitation, find salvation. Because the way we live our our lives, right? An inward change that produces an outward character. This thing that the, sent out as lights into the world, this thing that, that separates us from the world. Remember, we're pilgrims, right? We're just passing through. Like, like, my home is there. And yet, we're citizens. We have rights. We, we take families. Remember the, the letter that I wrote that was written in the second century that actually pertained to us today? Is that, yeah, we're here. Man, this ain't our home. There are things about this place that are good, and and God has created a space for us in creation that declares his glory, and, and we experience that. Hallelujah. I thought of a post that I happened to see on our Facebook page that you can put vanilla ice cream inside of coffee. And nobody knows. Like the world around, like... That's a pilgrim, all right? Because that pilgrim knows he's passing through. He's experiencing a little heaven right now. And the rest of the world don't know because he's separated from it. That's what I'm talking about. This place that he's going to take us today, this truth that he's going to speak to us, this, this, this thing. Wait, hello. This truth is going to so confuse us. I mean, change us of how we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be, that it's a little crazy. Let's look at verse 13. What's the first word in verse 13? Therefore. What does therefore mean? 
Because I said all that, I'm going to say this. So because of this, I'm saying this. Since I said this, I'm saying this. In, I told you guys this, but I'm going to add this. So the two are connected. So what we just read about, right, being an example to the world about helping people believe in Jesus Christ through the way we live our life actually is going to be lived out like this. Therefore, next word is a bad word. Submit. Oh, my goodness. It's almost as bad as obedience, right? We went through that. The word obey or obedience is this thing. Dobson does this thing. And, and he judges two children the way they are. Some children are compliant. Other children are defiant. Which one are you? Compliant or defiant? I had both. My daughter, who seems to be rather compliant. My son, who's just a little bit on the edge and rather defiant. But both helped me to see the difference in the battle that's inside of me. Because most of my life I've been defiant. When the world zigs, I zag. You know what I mean? When someone tells me what to do, uh, I do it my own way. Um, I'm in counseling. I've been recently married. And so things are changing inside of life for me that way. And, and it's to the good. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. Submission is a doctrine. If you had to say, what's of all the things that Peter has brought to us right now, what's the hardest thing for us to understand? That we're chosen? Like predestined? That, that the Holy Spirit sanctifies me? Or what about the Trinity? You know, Father, Son, explain the Trinity to me. And I don't know. I, I, don't, I can't fully comprehend that truth but but we're going to go into other truths and one of the doctrines one of the truths is submission don't worry i know it's a bad word and we will get to suffering in a couple weeks so don't feel like you're being left out if you're submitting and suffering we're going to get to all of it but he says therefore submit Well, I'm done here. I will look for a new job. And we'll keep moving. He says, submit to the king and the governor. Do you know our governor? Submit to the king and to the governor and to whoever else is before you, right? That is exactly what he's saying. Ho, 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 ho. Like, don't you know how corrupt our government is? Don't you know the things that they're doing? Look at the gas tax. There's a guy out in front of Lowe's taking signatures. And there's a line. And, and so I walked up, what are you having signatures for? To repeal the gas tax. And I'm like, you, what do you get? Two or three bucks a signature. And he goes, two. But he's got hundreds. So his day is glorious. He's going to have a $1,000 day collecting my signature on a paper that's not actually going to convince the government that they're not going to charge me extra money. And so I can argue and I can rail and I can get into this space. And, and then I'm reading and I'm saying, what do you mean, Pete? <laughs> like, what? submit to the government. Submit to the ruler. Sub like, doesn't he like Peter was way back then, all right? He was like thousands of years ago. And man, our, our governments are so deeply evil right now. I can't, we're moving to a red state, all of us, okay? Because, woo, that's the place. They're still evil there, and they're still corrupt there. Just not as bad as us, right? Isn't that, isn't that the conversations that I hear? I hear people actually preaching the news and and governmental conspiracy more than I hear them preaching the gospel sometimes. Look at my conversations at work. What have I talked about all day? Was it Jesus or was it the gas tax? Was it something else? And so I have to check myself and say, man, I'm really wiggling here. I'm really struggling. What do you mean submit to the government? Why, why would I ever, ever because I've got a list of YouTube videos, little shorts, 
that explain why I'm so opposed to these people. Why I'm opposed to this thing. And he's saying, specifically, submit to the leadership. I'm like, why would I do that? Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance, to every law of man. What? Oh, for the Lord's sake. Did you have to write that? Like, why would, okay, example, right? I've used this before at Gig Harbor. You're driving across Blackjack Bridge. You know where Blackjack is? So if you're coming from Safeway or Walmart or East Bremerton, you're driving across the bridge. What's something that everybody sees? This sign that is glowing, not flashing, not saying the word slow down, it's telling you that you're obeying the speed limit. Doing 35. Every time I drive across that bridge, it says 35. Well, 34 sometimes. I kind of waver in between, you know, whether I'm feeling, you know, bold and pushing it to 35 or whether I'm actually doing 34. What happens if it says slow down? Hmm. First thing I say is that sign's wrong. My car, look. I look, the very first thing, I look down at my, my speedometer and I'm like, no. I'm I'm not going that fast. But inside of me, that sign is telling me that I'm not obeying every ordinance of man. What's the rule on the highway? Five over, right? Eight or below is okay. Nine, you're mine. I don't know. There's all these things because I know if I just go nine miles an hour, do you know how much faster I get there? Boy, that's really bad. Something's happening. I might have to move it up. That sounds better. Thank you. It's hard because there is some rule I'm going to break. There is some law I'm going to break. There is this thing. And so I'm trying to figure out how to, to squeeze my space, my reality, my life into the rules that somebody wrote thousands of years ago who obviously don't know how hard we have it. But then I think, I think outside the box. And I say, who is Peter writing to? He's writing to pilgrims and and sojourners and people who are in Rome or around Rome or in Jerusalem that is ruled by Rome that have this oppression of the Caesar on them. And the, the persecution and the oppression is so bad they've been driven out into the wilderness. And they're brand new at believing in Jesus Christ because the church is just uh, just established. And so they're out there, they're struggling, and he's saying, I know you got various trials. Hang in there. Gird yourself up. Show them that you're a Christian. And by the way, obey all the rules that they're throwing on you. Do you know how bad it was? We talked about it, right? Do you know what Rome was like? Uh, It began the years of persecution. Caesar thought he was a race car driver. He would get in the chariot and they'd race around and race around. But then after racing all day, it would get dark and he couldn't race anymore. So Christians are the light of the world. So he would cover them in oil and stick a stick up their back and light them on fire so he could keep racing. And the people could walk to the Colosseum to see what a good racer he was. They would take animal skins and put on them because... He's the shepherd and they're the sheep of his flock. And so the the animals would eat them. And the persecution was actually real, much more real than it is with our government today. And then there was the taxes. Do you know Rome taxed them to the point of non-existence? Like, do you know how many times I've complained about the IRS in my life? Okay. Okay. I don't know how many times I've complained about the IRS, but it seems that every year they want a little bit more. Okay, the more I make, the more they want. It's this thing, and and taxes, you know, they build the roads, and yay, it's April 15th. Maybe I can get an extension. The taxes that they were under was so extreme that, that actually... 
slavery was more popular than anything else. The, the, the percentage in population was about 50-50. 50% slaves served 50% of the people who could actually pay the taxes. That's a hard life. That We left England, okay, because there was no representation without the taxation that we are going. We went to a different place because we wanted religious freedom. Our country was started in this space of like breaking out from the tyranny of the government. And so what does he mean that when I submit to the governors and the, and the people and the rules and the, the police and the flashing sign and the taxes and everything, why would he say the next words? For it's God's will. What are you talking about? It's God's will that I, like I'm just, I just want to take care of my family. I want a little house, you know, white picket fence, 2.5 children. That's the average. It's hard to get the 0.5. But the government will charge you for them unless you do itemized. And then you can get a break, kind of. We're in this space where do you know the conversation that we could be having in this moment about how unfair the government actually is. What they want to do to us. And he's telling me it's God's will. All right, I give up, Peter. How do I do it? What's my example? Where am I, where am I going with this? How do I get to this space where I can actually, inside of me, surrender? Submit. What submission? Why the doctrine of submission? Man, I got a lot of questions. I just want this explained. I want it figured out. There's a place in scripture that kind of helps us. Let's go to the book of Daniel. So do you believe Daniel 6 is where we're going? If you're there first, yell. I'm there. Sorry. Whoop, whoop. Okay. Is he asking us to turn our brains off? In submission, is he saying, all right, I need you people as Christians. You're believers now, and I know you're new in your faith. All right? And I know there's some trials going on. Some of you are being killed. And I want you to stand strong. I want you to be holy because God is holy. I want you to know that, that you're living for heaven. You're not living for this place. And, and so this is our faith. And, and we're going to show the rest of the world just how strong our faith is by being good Christians. And one way, you got to submit to the authorities. So you don't want you to turn off your brain. Whatever they say goes. If that's the way of it, and they're telling you to do it, then I want you to do it because it's what good Christians do. Is that the doctrine he's teaching us? No, right? How do we know? In the book of Daniel, Babylon came along and they took all the pretty, smart, intelligent young men to Babylon and they were going to make them Babylonian. Some countries, when they conquer somebody, like the Assyrians and the ten tribes of Israel, they take them and they disperse them through the land so that they be, no longer become a nation. Somebody like Babylon takes them and says, come to our country, you can be a Babylonian too. Like, look at our life, look at the things we do, look at this. And so they bring them there and they say, these young men, Daniel and his friends, Come and partake. Eat of the king's delicacies. It's amazing. The bacon you can have. Ham and cheese sandwiches. Hot dogs. Daniel says, I'm actually a Jewish. I'm actually kosher. I can't, like, can't do it. I'll tell you what. Let us eat what we eat. You guys eat what you eat. Let me keep the laws of my Lord and 
and we'll see how we fare. And obviously he fared really well. But he resisted what the government told him to do because it was different than what God told him to do. Next example is the three boys, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach and Benny, if you like veggie tales. They stood before the king, and the king was furious because at the sound of the music, you bow down and worship the statue, right? And they say, our God is able to deliver us from that fiery furnace. But even if he don't, we will not worship that statue. Boom. You're in the fire. They, they didn't pray and God delivered them from the fire. You guys have been so obedient. I'm just going to tell you right now that since you're so obedient and, and you're really just worshiping me and God alone, then I'm going to stop you from going in the fire. God said, no, you guys are going in the fire today. And it's extra hot. But I'm going to be in there with you. The next time is in six. And that's our scripture. Chapter 6, verse 1 says this. It pleased Darius to set. Yes, that's how you say it. I know I always said Darius. To set over the kingdom 120 satraps over the whole kingdom. And over these were three governors of whom Daniel was one. That the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because of an excellent spirit that was in him. The king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find a charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Can you imagine following every law of a kingdom that you're not part of? To the point where somebody says this excellent spirit in him has put us into a position that if we're going to catch him doing something wrong... It's got to be against his God. That's the only way. We'll make a law. That's what they said. We're going to make a law that, only, that you could only pray to the king. Oh, Darius. Oh, Darius. Worshipful king. Let's make a law that we can only worship you. We can only pray for a month, for 30 days to you. And so Daniel opened his windows and knelt before the window, windows three times a day and prayed to his God because he was not going to follow that law. They could not find any law that he broke of the kings unless it was according to the law of his Lord. Is that the space we're at? I mean, seriously, am I, could I be there? Because in the end, the, the king had no choice but to throw him into the lion's den. Do you remember? And the, the Lord kept the lion's mouth closed all night. But then the next morning when he found the conspiracy, threw the, the men and their families into the pit and the lions crushed their bones before they hit the ground. The example of someone like Daniel of actually being a pilgrim in this place. Do you know he never made it back to Israel? His buddy Jeremiah sent him this letter and said, hey, look, and, he, and he's reading it. He figures out the 70 weeks, and he's like, we're going back. Except me. Man, I was sent here. But do you know how many times it says that the spirit of the living God dwelt inside of him? That's what he's talking about, ain't it? What he's talking about is that we're so filled with the Holy Spirit that the government laws are easy to follow. The rules of the king are easy to do. You know why? Because when I submit to my king, 
My heart follows. So he goes like this. Little boy, his cause in trouble, bouncing up and down on the stool and just, you know, giving, going crazy, spills the cereal, spills the milk. The dad yells, sit down. Little boy sits down and he's just angry and he says, I might be sitting down in my body, but inside of me, I'm still standing up. This is different, ain't it? My attitude. Like, am I... Am I really submitting or am I submitting under duress? And are, have I really been convinced that the king, the king, has put the king in place? Why would you do that? Why would you give me these people? To... God has raised up evil kings to rule over people because of the sin that has filled the city that has filled the nation, that has filled the lives of the people. So don't think for a second that potentially what we have now is a result of the condition of our heart. He always has a remnant. There's a remnant inside of our, our, our country. And we're trying to be faithful. We're trying to to be obedient. We're trying to submit. We're, we're trying to be of good cheer. Uh, um, I'm not talking myself out of it every time. I'm actually believing it. Why? Next verses. Sorry, I'm about ready to read Daniel again. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. There are going to be people that accuse you of being conformists. There are going to be people that, that call you um, terrorists. We're going to have these moments where we want to stand up and fight and and, and make a difference. And if God has told us to do that, then do it. And God, if he hasn't told us, then don't follow the crowd. Don't just agree with something that sounds kind of suspect to you just because it sounds suspect. Actually put in the work. Investigate. There are some things that, that I oppose. And there are some things that I have to pray. Lord, help my heart. Submit so that I can put the argument of ignorant men away. Do you know the world is looking at us right now? We talked about that last week, right? Do you know that Jesus almost gave them permission? In John, we studied it. They will know that you are mine by the way you love one another. And so the world looks. So how is it in church? Obviously, out in the world, we can complain about the government. Who complains about the government in the church? All of us. I remember the pastor did this and the pastor in the AJ. Oh, my goodness. Stop that boy. It's easy. I get into the system of complaining. I get into the not content. I get into the struggle of it. And, and I believe the lies. And they're forming the lies because they want to take us down. Because why should we be happy in the midst of a storm? Why should I be content with a little or a lot? Why should I have the hope of heaven? Why should I know grace and mercy and truth and be in this space? And boy, you're part of the joy club, aren't you? No, I want you miserable like me. Don't you know, don't you know, don't you know, don't you know. They, them, those people are the ones that are against us. It's us and it's them. Stop the foolish lies, the foolish arguments, because he says, you are free, as free, yet not using my liberty as a cloak or a vice but as a bondservant of God. <laughs> All right. It just got confusing. I'm free, but I'm a bondservant. I'm free, but I'm a slave. And then I have this freedom, but I'm in a, a citizen in a place that I don't want to be in. 
I'm in a blue state right now. I'm like in one of the, this used to be called the dark state, but Oregon tried to outdo us is borderline right now. We're kind of fading, they're fading. It's a struggle because most unchurched people in the nation live in the upper Northwest. So that means the rulers that we elect over us and the people that that we place, right? It's, it's my vote. I put them in there. Uh-uh. It's God's sovereign hand. God either selects or allows the people to be in authority over you. Because he says that when the authorities, when it functions right, they come to discipline the evildoers and reward those who do good. I was a prison chaplain for 20 years. Do you know how many innocent men I met in prison? I'd say 80, 90%. Because it was someone else's fault. Because they did this. It was the one-armed man. Because that's how they were. Wait, 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 wait. I willingly broke a law, but I'm not willingly ready to pay the consequence that comes with it. But the government is actually here in its function to help that. I'm just not really ready to receive it. Because what am I, compliant or defiant? What is it, fair or unfair? Just or unjust? If we actually got justice, what would happen? We'd be in hell tonight, right? If I got even Stephen, Jesus, or my sins, choose. Not even Stephen's. Not justice. I I want mercy. I want grace. I want to live in this space where mercy and grace just take my sin away. As far as the east from the west. It doesn't take away the memory of it. And I remember everything. And I am ashamed of it. And I repent of it. And it fuels me not to be in that space. But how dare I judge somebody and say, well, they're that. Thank goodness it's not me. hard what's with the doctrine of submission like why would you just throw that on me now can we talk about the doctrine of blessing god owns the cattle on a thousand hills pressed down shaken together running over please because for the next couple weeks next week it's about our bosses Woo! after that Wives, submit to your husbands. I'm not trying to drive you away. I'm saying bring a friend. <laughs> saying, come on, let's get, uh, let's get a big group in here to hear this stuff. Because I believe what it says. That if we actually do what it says practically, the world's going to see something different. The world's going to see Christ in us. All the lies and the accusations, all the foolishness and everything that goes with it, it's not going to, it may affect us. How do I know? He gives us four examples. Last verse. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Every person ever created in the image of God, deserves to be honored. Every person. There are some people whose actions would cause us to believe that they don't. There are some people who who are so vile and evil that they separate themselves from God and the image of God is gone. But that's not up to me. It's not up to me to to put into a space and to become judge and jury and and convict and be in this space. If the opportunity comes, I'm supposed to reflect Christ. I'm actually supposed to have a supernatural understanding that every person is created in God's image and they hold a value because Christ died for them. Because they, the same mercy that saves me could save them if they so choose. 
the value that they have is supernatural. Will I allow that value to exist? Or because they believe different than me, they speak different than me, they look different than me. I'm not talking about us as a church except in every sin that comes in. That's hard. I'm not talking about blind tolerance. I'm talking about understanding the image of God and the power of it. It says, love the brotherhood. That's the church. One of the the most popular things right now is just to take down the church. That denomination against this denomination, against them, against this. Do you know that Jesus Christ is preparing the bride, the church, to be presented to him without spot or wrinkle? Is that how I see the church? Or, man, are we struggling? Like, we're trying to grow, and we're trying to make a difference, and, and man, that person still comes to church, and those people going out, and these people coming in, and we have six churches in one little corner of Kitsap County. We could barely get along. Love, the brotherhood. It says, fear God. Fear God is this reverent thing that causes me to see the words in the middle of what he wrote. This is God's will for you. Do you know that there are not many sections in the New Testament that says those words, this is God's will? How do I know? Because we're always asking, right? I'm just trying to figure out the will of God for my life. I'm just praying for the will of God right now. And yet we know there are sections in Scripture that say, This is the will of God for your life, your sanctification. Flee sexual immorality. And yet in our world, whoo, can't do that. We fear God because he's the king. We honor, we reverence, we obey, we submit to the king, which causes us to submit to the king. Which is the next thing, right? Submit to the king. That's twice he said it. If God mentions something in scripture twice, he means us to slow down and look at it. He says, very first thing, submit to your king. Then he says again, submit to your king. That's that difference I was talking about. I can practically submit. Or I can willingly submit. We know, hopefully, what Philippians 2 says That God has exalted Christ in the name of Christ above any other name. That every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Do you know that's willingly or unwillingly? That's the greatest example of who we are. I willingly, I am your bondservant. I'm willing to, to believe in you to a point that causes all this chaos all this history, all of this craziness, not to have power over me, but that you would, my Lord. So as I was praying about where we're going to go next, I really wanted to go to the book of Acts. Remember? Remember those days? And the Lord said, you're going to First Peter. I did read ahead, <laughs> and I knew we were going to have to go here. I knew that he was going to tell us to submit to the government and submit to our bosses and wives submit to your husband. And it's going to be some of the hardest words that we're actually being told because most of us just can't see it. And yet, that's how much Peter loved them. That's how much he loves us. Do you think for a second that I don't know that the church has been corrupted? that we allow sin to have a place that we call what is evil good and what is good evil. Do you not know that I I know the warnings of it? How how even the elect will turn away and our our ears will grow wax and and we will stack up for ourselves preachers who give us the words that we want to hear because our ears are itchy. You know, that for a second that I don't understand how the government works and and the corruption and the the money and, and the way of it. 
I do. We all do. Peter's not talking about that. He's talking about that song. I want to know you, the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the all-present God that is capable of doing anything, my king, whom I willingly surrender my life to. You are the one in charge. You are the one that is able to do anything and everything beyond what I can ask or think. And you're the one that I put my faith in. Not my job, my paycheck, not, not people, not man, not myself. And I'm standing in this place and I'm reading the depth of what he's saying. It isn't that I submit my life to the foolishness of man, but I surrender to you. So then what does he tell us to do? Pray, 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 pray. Do you think for a second that if we do not join together and start praying for these people, that their souls would be saved? Do you know it might not change the government? They're, they'll still do their things. They'll, they'll act the way they want to act and they'll do this. But if they see us, one in spirit, one in our truth and in our faith, one believing in our Savior, Jesus Christ, it'll be different. And on the day of visitation, right? Remember last week? They might be saved. They might give God glory. Would I be willing to take the torment and the pressure and the persecution and the taxes and just everything for the chance that that man or woman might be saved? Because that's what he's asking us right now. What do you believe? Do you believe it's your right to or do you willingly surrender to the one who is able? Every week we're going to go to the same place where this thing is brought before us and shown and dissected and explained and then he's going to ask us to do the same thing. Can you trust me? Can you trust me to be God? And every week I'm going to ask God to help me trust that he is God. Because it's not in me sometimes. But I want it to be. And Peter loves these people, loves us enough to say, come on, guys. I'm going to tell you a truth that you can't even comprehend right now. In the face of where you live and what you do, you don't even know the glory that waits because we're passing through. Hallelujah. So let's, let's go. As a church, as a body right now, as this cl- bring a friend. I double dog dare you. <laughs> Believe. Because that's what he wants. So it's just to believe, to trust, to be his children. Let's pray. Father, I am thankful for this day and this opportunity, for the, the subject, for the reflection of our life, for the look in the mirror for the struggle, for the power to overcome the struggle, for the power of love, the foundation of love that we just sang about, for, for truth, for that rushing wind that takes me from my stubbornness and just frees me, that, that allows me not to make excuse, but just to trust you. We need you right now. More than ever, as a church, as a big church, as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ, but specifically in P.O. Naz, we need you in this moment. If we are ever going to be, then we want to be with you and for you and through you. I pray your anointing over every one of us this week. Give us the ability to see the things that we're blind to. Give us the peace to steal the arguments that we complain about. Give us the living hope, the living stones, the living word to dwell within us. I trust you in this. 
Go with us now as we leave in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in his grace.